Isn't God good? Ah, oh, man. I tell you what. I am so excited, so pumped up, not just because it's March Madness weekend or month or whatever, because we have the children with us today. It's a fifth Sunday, so we close the children's church, give all our workers a well-deserved break, and they're in here. So we got a lot of little scudders around. You may see them. And if you are one of the little younglings with us, little Jedi Padawan learners, hopefully you have received children's sermon notes. If you fill these out and you take diligent notes and you don't miss a thing, come up and show Miss Leanne because we have a prize for everybody after this, okay? Deal? Adults, if we have enough, maybe you can do this as well. Make sure you take notes. Here, I'm going to give that to you or I will eat it right now. March Madness. Raise your hand if you've been following it. All right, who's your team? Was it Carolina? Anybody? Was it Duke? Who else? What, what talk? Kentucky? Oh, oh, come on. Auburn? For real? You're saying that to a Bama fan? What is All right. Invitation, you're first. Down at the altar. We'll see. March Madness. Wherever you are in your journey of madness, whether you're still high and you're hopeful, like my wife's team, Kentucky, or whether... You're not quite so hopeful. Or maybe you got invited to the not invited tournament, and maybe you played there. Who, wherever you are, God has a word for us today. I want to ask you a question. When you are competing, and you are sweating, and you are working hard, and you are pouring your heart into a game, and you lose, how do you feel? Or better yet, let me ask this question. When you are pouring your heart into a game, and you are working hard, oh, you got your hands, all right, pass it back. And you're doing, and you're going, and you're, and a ref makes a bad call. Oh, I hit a nerve there. Now you're talking, Pastor. And someone cheats, and you lose the game. In fact, it's because of their cheating that you lose the game. How do you feel? Are you happy? Praise the Lord. A cheater beat me and won again. Are you excited? No. You're mad. It's okay to admit it. Don't look like you're self-right, like you got it all together. You get mad. I know you do. I've seen some of you. I've been at Buffalo Wild Wings, and you didn't know I could watch you? <laughs> I've seen this. And, and listen, if, if you, if you uh, let's just take the walls down. You're safe here. Ain't none of us got it together. I'm about to share a story that's embarrassingly, painfully, shockingly accurate of what we're dealing with, okay? So the first truth grenade I want to hit you with, straight out of the block, before we even get to the scriptures, is this. How we react when we're angry and annoyed reveals a lot about us. And how I wish this were not true. <laughs> how I wish this did not reveal a window into my soul when, when I lose it. Have you ever been around someone who's lost it? And they've lost their cool and, and they just go slam crazy? How did you feel? All right, now let's bring it a little bit closer to home. How did you feel when it was you? How did you feel when it was you that lost control? And I'm not talking about just a little mad, like, mm, I'm righteously indignant. No, no, no. I'm talking like full-blown rage, anger. Maybe even crossing a line into sin. Or maybe somebody has wronged you, and you've been mad at them, and maybe you are here today, and you are dealing with a little bit of bitterness tucked stuff way down, or maybe a little bit of unforgiveness. And that anger has festered and it's led to sin well listen i'm ashamed to admit this but this just so you know full disclosure your pastor has gotten mad once maybe twice maybe a couple of times why are you laughing <laughs> one of my very first dates with my wife i wanted to impress her so i took her where every good man does and when you want to woo the woman that you hope to marry i took her to the arcade yes <laughs> you've done it too i see and it was awesome. I thought the way to this woman's heart is to make her stand beside me for hours watching me enjoy my game while I plump quarter after quarter after quarter into the machine. See, I know how to treat a girl right. So we brought her to this arcade and things are going great. And the, the game that I was playing was this one right here. And this game had, uh, had a hold on me. Anybody ever play this game? Oh, don't start. Do not start. It's addictive. It's a wrestling game. And the guy that I like to play was this guy on the left right here. This is El Stingray. This little guy right here kind of represented me. And you got to go against these huge guys. You've got Titan and Grader and Hagar and all these huge guys. And the goal is to beat them. And you keep going. And you fight person after person after person. And if you pump enough quarters into it, you can finally get really far in the game. 
Oh, but on this particular day, the Spirit was with me. <laughs> and I was going, and it was awesome. And Amy was there, and she was seeing a side of me of compassion, and, I mean, co competition, <laughs> not compassion. And I was going to town, y'all. I didn't even have to put many quarters in. That's how good I was doing. You know what I'm talking about? Where, like, you're going, and the guy comes up beside you, and he puts his quarter on the glass, signifying that I got next game. And I'm like, you can take your quarter back, because I am not losing this. And you keep going and going. And y'all, I went farther than I've ever gone. I was so excited. I was so into this game. I didn't even have to check to see if I had any other quarters. Then I re realized after probably a good hour, maybe two hours of playing this game with my sweet, soon-to-be fiance standing beside me, cheering me on, I lost. But I saw the words that spoke spirit life to me. Continue? Question mark. And then the countdown began, 20, 19, 18. Well, that's usually no problem when you have quarters. And I realized I was on the very last frame of the game, and I was about to do something no one had ever done in history. I was about to beat this game. I was going to win Slam Masters. Angels would sing, the sky would part, a light would come down, and all would be right with the world in that moment. I reached in my hand to put that quarter. Are you kidding me? No quarters. It's okay, I had a dollar. I had a dollar. I still had 18 seconds left. I looked for that quarter changing machine and I saw one on the other side of the arcade. It might as well been in Siler City. And I ran over to it and I'm trying to stuff that dollar in and Amy, Amy, what's the countdown? 17 seconds, 16 seconds. I'm trying to put in a world ticket. I'm trying to stuff the quarter. Give me the quarter, come on. And then I finally give up and I spy a man who works there with that little quarter best, you know, little ching ching. And I run over to him. I think he's flirting with some girl because he's ignoring me. And I'm like, dude, here, how many seconds? 12 seconds. And I'm trying to give her this. I'm like, you got to take the, give me this. He's what you want? You want some quarters? <laughs> Slowest guy on earth. He's like, one, two. And I'm like, just do it. And I run. And I'm running up. And it's like slow motion. And I see Amy. And she's looking at the arcade game. And then she looks over at me. And I see three. Continue? Two. I'm like, no. And I, it's like I'm diving, but I'm not. But I feel like, and I get to the machine and I put the quarter in. It says, one. And I go to hit the one player continue. And two words appear on the screen. Please don't say those words. <laughs> There's a reason why I didn't say those. I'm, I'm, I'm in therapy for this. Game over. Church, I cannot tell you how mad I got in that moment. Yes, Amy can. <laughs> it is quite possible that I uttered some things that shall not be uttered. It is quite possible that I might have lightly touched the video game. No, I was a licensed and ordained minister already at this point. Okay? I want you to think about, in this moment, I have absolutely blown my testimony, my witness. I hope nobody knew me from church there. Think about this. In this moment, and then it hit me, it's really hard for me to witness for Christ. It's really hard for me to share love when I'm mad. Know what I'm talking about? Yet scripture tells us so clearly, be angry and do not sin. In fact, it goes farther. It says, don't even let the sun go down on your anger. You know, that is so much easier said than done, but we're going to dive in. So if you're ready, take a big breath and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the ESV today, a translation I've never used in the pulpit before, but great translation, the ESV. While you pull up Ephesians 4, let me welcome our online guest at our campus. Great to have you with us. Come check us out in person if you can. We would love to see you. Ephesians 4, we're going to start in verse 25 and read through verse 32. All right, everybody got it? Here we go. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we're members one of another. Be angry and do not... Can we skip this verse, please? Can we skip this? All right, we'll read it. Be angry and do not sin, Pastor Matt. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. But rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, 
as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, what a list, all this be put away from you. Oh, wait, there's one more, <laughs> along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Y'all, that is a mouthful. There is so much wisdom packed. Here is your roadmap. Spiritually mature Christian, follower of Christ, somebody wants to go deeper in your... Here is your roadmap. In fact, if you want to do a bird's eye summary of what we just read, you can break it down like this. A Christian's uniqueness in this world should be obvious and evident by their morality, verse 25, by their mood, verses 26 and 27, by their money, verse 28, by their mouth, uh-oh, verses 29 and 30, and then lastly by our manners, verses 31 and 32. All those are great, but today I want to zero in on verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And as always, Jesus is our example here. At the potter's hand, we are unashamedly, unapologetically striving to be followers of Jesus. Make no mistake about it. And this book is our guide. And here, Jesus, who we read all throughout the New Testament, is absolutely perfect and without sin. Yet at the same time, we read that on time, occasion, he kind of got mad. So how does that work? Is getting angry a sin? And if not, where is the line? Because we know Jesus very famously overturned tables, made a whip, and drove out people who were in the temple doing things that shouldn't be done in the temple. We know that on occasion, he got so worked up and angry that he actually went into the faces of the Pharisees and called them all sorts of incredible, accurate, derogatory names. Did he sin? No way. Never. Yet he was angry. So what do we do? Where is the line? How do we know when anger has taken a step too far and crossed the line into sin? There's two reasons we need to look at this. The two things we have to remember about biblical anger. The first one is its reason, and the second one is its reign. The first one, the reason. What is its purpose? Why are you mad? See, Jesus' anger was holy, and it was righteous indignation. It was perfectly justified. Usually in the temple, his heavenly father's being dishonored, and the hypocritical Pharisees are doing things that shouldn't be done there. Anger at unrighteousness and injustice is not sinful, okay? Hear me say that. Anger at unrighteousness and injustice is not sinful. Sometimes it is actually quite justified, as we see in the scriptures. One of my favorite quotes from the great Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, to be angry against sin is a high and holy thing. So, you know, i got to ask. I'm your friendly neighborhood pastor. We're all in this together. When is the last time any of us were angry about sin? Sin that we see in the world? Or better yet, sin that we see in ourselves? Or do we just laugh at all? <laughs> That's just me. I'm just a fallen critter. Are you okay with that? Or do we strive to be holy? Think about that. How do we feel about sin? Now hear me, I promise, this is not a warning uh, of, or a license to next time you fly off the handle or you fly into a, ra a rage, this is not a license to say, oh, I'm not angry, I'm, I'm righteously indignant. <laughs> it's justified. No, this is not about that. Unless you are angry at sin or some horrible injustice that breaks God's heart, then you need to check the reason for your sin. The next thing we look at is its reign. Think about this, the duration of it. How long is your anger lasting? Because trust me, if you haven't feel, felt that rage and that surge of adrenaline through you, it is an instant rush. It changes chemicals in your brain. And it's not supposed to last long. It is supposed to be a short reign because this emotion is powerful. It leads to action. So when we allow anger to have a long reign, a long duration, and trust me, it can easily be nurtured into resentment into bitterness, dare I say, crossing the line into sin, where we harbor unforgiveness. See, that's where it becomes self-serving, and we like it, and we cuddle it. It's my anger, my precious. I just... If there's a scene from your past that is coming up in your mind right now that you still struggle with unforgiveness, 
You are in the right place on the right day, amigo. Relax. Ain't none of us go through a life without dealing with this. You are safe here. We're going to look at how do we handle this. This is so important. While Paul comes out, he says, do not take your anger to bed. Don't do it. Don't take your anger to bed. Stay awake and plot your revenge. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But as I researched this and I Googled this, I saw two things come up that really reveal how our culture feels. Now, let's say you're not married. I know we got a lot of younglings with us today. Let's say you got a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend across town or whatever, and you're Facebooking late at night, and you guys have had a fight, and you're dealing with those inner emotions, the good and the bad side are talking. For your passive-aggressive friends, maybe this is you right here. Me, I should talk to him so we don't go to bed angry. Inner me, say goodnight. Then post on social media so he knows you're awake. <laughs> We've all dealt with those passive-aggressive people. We're not supposed to go to bed angry. So this sign right here is absolutely classic to illustrate you have missed the point. Don't go to bed angry. I ain't slept in three months. <laughs> ain't no problem. Congratulations, you missed Paul's point. We're not supposed to go to bed angry. So if you wrestle with this, relax. Two biblical steps. The first thing we do, examine the reason for your anger and then keep its reign short. If you don't, trust me, you have opened up a huge foothold for the devil. And nobody wants that. Look at verse 27. It says specifically, give no opportunity to the devil. Not even a foothold. Let me show you what I mean. The Greek word used here is topos. A beautiful word. It's where we get the word topography. As in the study of maps or the study of land. This is what our soldiers have to go through to learn how to fight the enemy on their terrain. They have a good lay of the land, the topography. Topos literally means the place. In the New Testament here, topos can be translated as place, location, or, wait for it, opportunity. So in Ephesians 4.27, it literally means this. Don't give the devil a place or opportunity in your heart. That's what anger does. Don't even give them a foothold. What's a foothold? We got any climbers? Anybody ever climbed? Scale? Yes? All right. One climber. All right. Well, this is just for me and you then. All right. I'm going to put up a picture and I want to show you something. This right here is a lady who's climbing this cliff. A toehold or a foothold is what they need before they can move to the next spot. So younglings, if you're a climber, you have to have three points of contact at all times. Either two hands and a foot before you move your next one, or two feet secure in one hand before you look for your next foothold. This is also what soldiers use when looking to invade an enemy fort or a compound. So if you're looking for a weakness, just like in this next one, I remember at Age of Ultron, Iron Man's flying, he's looking at Sokovia, and he's got to invade this castle, and he's flying. He's scanning for weaknesses in the defenses of this castle. This is a classic, perfect illustration. Here's what's creepy. This is exactly what the enemy is doing to you right now. He is scanning your life and looking for weaknesses, looking for any little doorway that you have left open, any toehold he can get. And Paul says, you know what that toehold is? It's anger. It's bitterness. It's resentment that has crossed the line and has a sinful foothold in our heart. And then he goes on to say, the longer you let that anger and that unconfessed resentment and that bitterness reside in your heart, it begins to plant and it begins to rewire you. And all the devil needs to get his foot in the door of your heart is for you to keep just a little bit of bitterness or anger or resentment. Because as I've said many times, that leads to hurt feelings and hurt feelings lead to anger and anger leads to hate and hate leads to suffering not a good sermon if I can't work in at least one Star Wars reference. It's, it was just too perfect. Listen to the Apostle Yoda. All kidding aside, if you look at this and you need a help, I want you to memorize this next word. When we get angry, our anger is just one letter off from this word right here. One letter. Danger. Think of the times you have flown off the handle or witnessed somebody fall off the handle. You almost feel like you're in danger, don't you? It's so unbecoming a Christ follower. Some of my biggest regrets are when I've lost control or I've been out of, you know, and you ever been with somebody that you're trying to witness to and you're, you're mad? Or, I mean, it's really hard to show someone the love of Christ when you're mad or to be that great testimony. You ever met those people that are just hard to love? 
and you want to be a good witness. I mean, they are, it's just like, I'm trying really hard to like you. Help me help you. I want to like you, but my goodness, these people are making it so hard and they're difficult. You ever know anyone like that? They're like heavenly sandpaper. They're like as cuddly as a cactus. They have the personality of a sunburn, and yet we are called to love them. That's not easy. That is so much easier said than done. God says you are called to love them. In 1962, a brand new comic book showed up. And it changed the landscape of superheroes forever. It hit the newsstands and was an instant hit, but he's only gotten bigger. I'm going to describe it, and I want you to see if you can guess who burst onto the scene. This comic was about a doctor or a scientist who, when he gets enraged, angry surges of adrenaline transform him into a huge, green-skinned rage monster. Who am I talking about? Absolutely. The Incredible Hulk. This is so... Now, for those of you who are a little bit older and you, you're not into the Marvel stuff, back in the 70s, oh, God bless America, the, the glorious 70s, the golden age of TV. <laughs> Can anyone tell me the name of the actor who played the Hulk? Lou Ferrigno. All right, bonus question. Who played Dr. Banner before he transformed into the Hulk? I can't believe you knew that. I was all prepared to share who that was. Bill Bigsby. And right before he turned into the Incredible Hulk. He had a famous, y'all, I'm going somewhere spiritual with this. Be ready. He turned into some, this is so, does anyone remember the famous phrase that he shared? Yes, yes, you got it. Don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. You know why we can relate to this? Because that's us. That is us. Dr. Josh Kaplow a physiologist, psychologist, he says, that, listen to this, he says, anger is a highly physiological emotion. There are so many changes going on in our bodies when we're angry. We literally become a different person, if only temporarily, when we're angry enough. Adrenaline rushes through our body, think about this, causing us to suddenly feel strong and ready to act. We instantly go from normal to an incredible Hulk-like state. Wow. No wonder this surge of emotions. And if you've ever felt like that, I have good news. You are not alone. I wanted to share one of our heroes of the faith, the great Moses. He was dealing with a bunch of tough people to love, like thousands and thousands and thousands of them. He was leading them out of captivity, out of slavery, and the group was doing nothing but complaining against him and Aaron. We don't have this. We don't have that. It's like, come on. And he's bringing them, and he's pleading with them, and he's being far more patient than I would have. And he's trying to lead them to the promised land, and they start whining and complaining and rebelling against God again. But this time it gets out of control. Said, we don't have water. We don't have figs. We don't have quail. We don't have grapes. We don't have pomegranate. We don't have a PlayStation, no Wi-Fi, no Minecraft. Oh, and did I mention again, we don't have water? And Moses, check out his reaction. This is incredible. His first reaction is to seek the Lord. Look with me in Numbers 20, verse 6. He says, Moses and Aaron turned away from the people, that's the complainers, the whiners, the grumblers, and goes to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Okay, y'all, there is a lesson right there with how to handle that, okay? Don't miss that. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You'll provide enough water from the rock to satisfy five people. No? You, to satisfy a couple clans. To satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So look what Moses does. Verse 9. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come gather at the rock. Wow. Good job, Moses. Yes! So far, so good. Moses is doing the right thing. He's called him up. Let's see what he does next. I love this. Listen up, you rebels, he shouted. Okay, there it is. That's, <laughs> that's how I would have acted. He gets mad, and he says, Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand, and he struck the rock twice with the staff, and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. Great. Everyone's happy, right? Good times? Not so fast, my friends. Verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, mm -mm, that's not what I told you to do. 
because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you're not going to be the one to lead them to the promised land. And then we see he goes on, this whole city is named Mirabah, which means arguing and complaining and bittering. Ugh. Think about what, don't miss what just happened. He got angry. Y'all, the consequence for his anger was huge. Look at this photo. and Just picture him. He comes. He's instructed to just speak, simply speak, and let God take all the credit, all the glory. He has nothing to do with it, but he doesn't. In his anger, he grabs his club, and he slams it, not once, but twice, strikes the rock. God still honors his word and feeds and, 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 and quenches the thirst of this huge contingent of people. But there's a consequence when he got that angry. Think about the times you've been angry. Has there been a consequence that you saw right away? Or maybe some you've been paying for a little bit later? Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible, verse 5, chapter 2, says this. says, for anger kills a fool, and jealousy slays the gullible. Did you catch that third word? Anger kills. Y'all, it doesn't get more blunt than that as a warning to us. If you are an out-of-control rageaholic, Listen to what happens, because I'm fixing to share with you the antidote to this. As I was researching this, I love the Greek and the Hebrew, but today you get a bonus word. If you're taking notes, you get a Latin term, and it's sentire. And it is this incredible Latin word that simply means to feel. It's the emotional side, okay? Sentire. It's where we get the word resent. So when you add the re in front of that and make it resentire, it means to feel those same emotions again and again. And again, so check out what is happening. As we recall that offense in that person who made you mad, and you dredge it up again and again, those emotions surface, and they begin to harden and draw deep lines into our brain. As we replay them over and over, that becomes how we feel when we see that person. Huh? Mm, not if you know what you're... Okay, all right, four honest people in this room. That's awesome. Those lines carve those deep crevices in our brain, and we remember them. And those synapses fire that way. And when we, that's where the danger lurks. The devil loves to come and, and stir up those coals and blow that and fan that and cause dissension between you and your family member or you and that coworker who gets on your nerves and you're trying so hard to love them. But they're just so unlovable. Well, remember, but for the grace of God, that could be you. That could be me. And we're called to love those that are hard to love. We're called to love those who may be as cuddly as that cactus. They need the love of Jesus. That, that could be us. Robert Ingersoll put it like this. I love this. So poetic. He says, anger is the wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. <laughs> Man, that is powerful. When we get angry, it's like we lose our minds. We say things we don't mean. We do things we regret. Anybody with me on that? Awful lonely up here. Okay, all right, I'll just preach to myself. When this happens, it ruins friendships. It hurts our marriages. This resentment starts to come. Let's be honest, be real here. It's not easy to avoid feelings of anger when we're offended, when we're hurt. I get it. Trust me, I get it. It takes time to process these difficult emotions. But here's the warning. Don't replay the offense over and over in your mind. And somebody today needs to hear that line. Maybe it's somebody streaming. That is for you. When you're laying in bed at night, quit replaying the offense over and over in your mind, thinking of ways you could have responded. I know the perfect response. It's been seven weeks now, but now I've got the perfect response. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. Don't hold it back. Whatever that song is. I love how David Jeremiah puts it. He has this beautiful quote. He says, resentment makes us permanently angry. It carves deep lines in our faces, and it adds a, a heaviness to our steps. Church, this is no way to live. No way. Yet some of us are doing it every day. Are you ready to drop that burden? Oh, this is awesome. Because two other biblical giants of the faith dealt with this. Two people we all admire. The first one is the wisest man of all time, the wisest man to ever live, Solomon. He says this, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make that temper flare. 
A gentle answer deflects anger. Your translation may even say it diffuses anger. I love that. This is how profound this is. In an age of Twitter and Facebook and instant rage and constant offense where everything is amplified, Solomon knew this 3,000 years ago. Don't react the way your flesh wants you to. In fact, are you ready for the hidden gem of the day? Get your pens out. When those angers and those embers fan into flames and you start ready and you're about to be ready to have a Twitter rant. Mm, I'm talking to somebody. This is what Solomon is saying. He says, underreact. Underreact. Go the other way that your feelings are telling you to go. Don't miss that. Underreact. I think, Ryan, we got that. I want to put that up for them because this is so killer. I want the kids to write this down. Underreact. Your flesh will tell you overreact. When that person comes up and they're wagging their finger in their face, this happened to me just recently. I had to do it. You know what I did? I took these steps. I took a step back. I paused for a second. I grabbed my drink. I took a sip. <laughs> and I underreacted. You know what it did? It helped to defuse anger and the situation. Even if I was justified in smacking down this person's accusations, I chose to practice these steps. Underreact. Take a step back. Pause for a second. Breathe. When you avoid arguing and you avoid quarreling, which we're commanded to do, we, we stop putting that person in a locked position. You see what I'm saying? That's a losing strategy for loving someone to Christ. When we get in somebody's face and we are accusatory like that, it causes them to lock into their position. And the Apostle Paul was giving Timothy incredible guidance. He said this in 2 Timothy. He says, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments. They only start fights. A servant of the Lord, that's you and me, must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Must be able to teach and wait for it. Be patient with difficult people. There it is. Anybody, anybody have a difficult person in their life? At work? At school? Yeah? Okay. This, this middle section here is so honest. I love it. We're going to pray for them. And then they're going to pray for us because the rest of y'all are lying. Because this is for everybody. Harboring bitterness, harboring anger and resentment is like poison. In fact, it's that beautiful saying. It's like when you hold on to this, you're drinking the poison and you're hoping the other guy dies. That's madness. It doesn't happen. Who's getting hurt with the poison? The one who's ingesting it, the one who's keeping it inside, the one who is, who is stewing in this and replaying it and letting it burn lines into their brains where this is constant bitterness and it's etching age into their face and heaviness to our steps. Y'all, that is not the image of Jesus that I see in the Bible. And we're supposed to be little Christ. That's what Christian means. Followers of him. So as March Madness ends and you're happy about it or you're bad, whatever, if I could leave you with one powerful, life-changing challenge. It comes from the scriptures. And it comes from the Lord himself. And it is a beautiful, powerful passage from the greatest sermon ever told, the Sermon on the Mount, where we actually hear parts of the model prayer. And Jesus says this, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Wow. Y'all, you want to be forgiven? We have to be forgiving. Is that easy? That's the goal. Only with the Spirit indwelling us can we do this, can we live. Our flesh wars against this. We have got to let some things go. We have got to be people who forgive. Maybe you're struggling with that today. It's okay. You're safe. We all do. Maybe today when we pray in just a minute, you want to come to this altar and you just want to pour out your heart to the Lord and give it to him. He can take it. He's big enough. In fact, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to have our musicians come up and I want to share with you and ask you a quick question. Raise your hand if you have dealt with or you know someone in your family or a friend who has ever dealt with cancer. Okay, almost every hand in this room has gone up with cancer. Mike Bailey, an American citizen, has cancer. And he saw the doctors and he heard the bad news and he heard the horrible prognosis all about his cancer. So between chemotherapy appointments, his doctor advised him, you better take your bucket list trip. 
And he got with his wife and they said, baby, where do you want to go? We could go anywhere in the world. We have just enough money that we can go off on one last hurrah before I go to glory. And they chose to go to the beautiful, historic water city of Venice. Now, younglings, if you're not familiar with Venice, it's that place that has water taxis everywhere and those gondola boats where the guy's standing on the back with the pole and he's pushing you through the waterways, you know what I'm talking about? And at night, it is breathtaking. It is so gorgeous. So they saved up and scrounged up their money. And in between horrible chemotherapy treatments, they flew over to Europe. And they made their way into this beautiful historic city. And on the opening night, things go horribly wrong. This guy right here is Mike Bailey. And this is his wife. And as they were taking this gondola boat ride, he reaches for his back pocket. And he realizes he has nothing to pay for his ride. Then he realizes he has been robbed. Day one. All his credit cards, all his cash, every contact info he had, everything has been stolen from him. And he had just landed. This has absolutely ruined any chance of one last dream getaway with his wife. Let me tell you something. Mike was mad. Wouldn't you be? Your last trip with your spouse? Are you kidding me? He was angry. Guess what he did? He took it to the Lord. He said he prayed about it. He said, God, will you help me manage this anger? And he wrote an open letter, and a local Italian paper picked it up. He wrote an open letter to the thief. He said to the person who stole my wallet, this is my last trip. It's with my wife, for I am dying from cancer. You left me with no money, no credit cards, Please imagine for a moment what this does to your victim. I have been praying for forgiveness. Check this out. I also am now praying for you. Please turn away from your sin, which hurts innocent people. And then he goes on to say three unbelievably mature words. I forgive you. And he just signed it. Michael Bailey, USA. Could you do that? Here's an actual photo of the letter. Before it was picked up by an Italian newspaper, guess what happened next? This first half was absolutely ruined. It was decimated. His trip, he knew, was going to be short-lived, and he would go home an absolute failure where he would die. But instead, God had different plans, and the overwhelming generosity and hospitality flew in. And now when he looks back on it, he said, the memory of this trip initially was absolutely ruined. But after writing this letter, the memory has now gone from anger to sheer joy. When we choose to forgive, church, when we don't hold that March madness, that anger, we unshackle the chains of anger. And we are free. Forgiveness helps us move from anger to joy because anger eats at us like a cancer. And it always hurts us. It never hurts the one you're mad at. Don't kid yourself. They couldn't care less that you're mad at them. So why not let it go? Why not let it go? Maybe today is your day. If you want victory over this, I want to show you three things that you do. Six words. Are you ready for this? The first thing you do is you own it. You admit it. And then confess it and then forsake it. You treat it that seriously as any other sin. You admit it. God, I am sorry. I am angry. He can take it. I am mad. And here's why. And I'm going to bring it out in the open. I'm going to confess it to you. Here's what it is. I'm putting it in this box and I am leaving it at the foot of the cross. I am leaving it at the altar. I confess it and now I'm going to forsake it. I am literally going 180 degrees the other direction. And I am done with it. That is our goal. Move forward. Don't look back. And don't replay it over and over. That offense, that hurt, break that cycle. And anytime those feelings of anger start to flare back up, and you feel them and you know they're coming, immediately stop. Admit it. Confess it. And then forsake it. You take those thoughts captive, church. Hear me. You declare out loud if needed, not today, Satan. I am done. Maybe in the past I would have replayed this scene over and over in my head and let you have a chain and put those strangleholds on me, but not today. Today you lose. You will not have me be a captive to anger anymore. I refuse. I am a child of the king, and he has set me 
free. So if that's you and you're struggling with that, today is your day. We're going to open the altar. In a minute, if you're new here, we just stand and we sing one last song before we go, and it's awesome. It's the highlight of our day. You'll see people coming and praying for a couple minutes. If you want me to pray with you, I'm happy to do that. You'll see some people making an altar right where they are in their chair, and they just sing to the Lord. Just be obedient. God has been here today. Be obedient. Pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. Would you move in our hearts? Show us what you have for us today, and may we respond in obedience as we cast our cares and anxieties on you, for you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen.